Hello, I'm here with Andrea Mihalik of Wild Cherry. Now, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yep. I say Mihalik, but it's fine. Oh, Mihalik. Okay, there you go, you guys. It's Mihalik. All right, Andrea has agreed to let me interview her, and I'm so grateful to you for this because so many people I talk to are enamored with you, and they want to know more and more about your business and how you really got yourself established. So can you just explain a little bit about what you do and then maybe briefly how you got started? Sure. I've, uh, I've had my business for about, first of all, thank you for having me and interviewing me and asking me questions. It's always nice to uh, share your knowledge and what you've learned along the road. So um, I'm happy to be here with you. Anyway, um, I started my business about six years ago and I didn't know anything about upholstery or sewing and um, I just was really passionate about, about finding a new career and uh, what I do though I get all vintage frames and I strip them down to the bare bones and then I build them back up using old world techniques and all earth friendly materials and um, then I make them really modern with my finishing touches and then I try to sell them to someone. Um, tell me if you were if somebody didn't understand what you were talking about on the old world techniques. What what are you talking about there? So I use eight way hand tied coil springs and horse hair, natural cotton, and a hundred percent wool on all my and, and on all my chairs. And then I also use uh, goose down feathers and all my cushions. Oh oh okay. So does this? Um, I can ask this later, but does this um, in this definitely increases the price of your product? Yes, I feel like sometimes people look at the prices that I ask for my chairs and they don't understand why or what makes my chairs different, but a lot of upholsterers use foam and it's definitely quicker and cheaper to use foam than to work in the techniques that I do. And uh, how did you learn that? I think we talked about that one time and um, I, I kind of remember, but would you share with everybody how you really learned the, I would call them traditional techniques? I think it probably falls somewhere in between like you know, tradition, the real traditional because, you know, all those classes over in, in England and Wales and everything, I'm not quite as as traditional as everybody else, but I try to do it cleanly, you know, is, is the word that I would use for my upholstery. And I took a class in New York City and it was only four weeks long and you can't really learn it, everything that you need to know in four weeks. So then I came back to Philadelphia and I asked around and I found an internship. I'm in my 40s, I was working for free and but it was at a great company called BDDW, and they were using um, old world techniques, and they still do. Their furniture is very pricey, but that's where I learned how to work with horsehair and eight-way hand-tied coil springs. How long did it take you before you really felt like you had, I, I'm not going to say mastered it because there's a difference in the definition of mastery, but before you felt confident to go out and do your, your own chair on your own and sell it? Well, I, I stayed at the company for four months, and I was only there two days a week. But after four months, I felt like, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off on my own now. But still learning, I had someone come in who I met at that job, and he came in, and we became friendly, and he would come into my studio once a week for two hours, and he, you know, kind of helped me. And so he still comes and works for me, but he helps me, and I'm still learning today. Really? Yeah, I definitely. That. Um, okay, well, let's, I had some class people send me some questions, and I've sent you the questions, but I will just get over here and ask you the first one, and this was a girl from um, Oakland. I think she's got a shop in Oakland, and it's probably similar to yours, only on a really beginning level, okay? But her question to you is, well, she has quite a few, so it is, was there one key event or turning point in your business that you felt really got you established? That's the easiest answer and question ever because I applied for the Architectural Digest Home and Design Show really early on within my first year and I got accepted and I made a whole bunch of pieces, went to the show and that show really changed my life because when I started the Architectural Digest Show I had 60 likes on my Facebook page and I was like how am I ever going to get people to know about me? And I went to the Architectural Digest Home and Design Show and then it just took off because I got some press and, and people found out about me. And like when, after you did that, did you come back and sort of have a new um, confidence? I mean, did you feel that inner feeling like, yeah, I can really do this? I did. I definitely gained confidence as soon as I went and set up the show. Before the show even opened, I had other vendors there looking at my prices and they said, yo, 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 you're in New York and look at your stuff. You need to put like a one in front of everything that you're asking. Oh, for. wow. Yeah. So that was a confidence booster for me. And so how long was, 
when was that show compared to when you started? Um, within the first year. Wow. About a, okay. Maybe a, a year in. Wow. You are, I, I remember when you were just starting to post things online and it just seemed like everything took off so quickly for you. It's the show. I was so fortunate and lucky. Really. How would you um, advise somebody if they wanted to get connected like that? How, wh how, did they, how did you do that? I would say do shows. You know, there's all kinds of shows. You can do a show in your local town. You can, you know, all kinds of arts and crafts shows or higher-end home shows. I would do home and furniture design shows okay. and good shows. I went to High Point to see if I wanted to do to do that show that wasn't for me but I went and checked it out and and so I go to shows I go to ICFF and I love it but it's really not for me one of a kind type of person okay um okay that's good I'm I'm just you know I'm still kind of in awe of you so it's hard for me to move on um <laughs> Okay, um, now th this girl is named Kathleen, and she asked the same, uh, or she asked this question, how much of the work you do is consulting? She, we were talking about um, sometimes people just want to get your expertise as an upholsterer, and I believe you and I talked about that one time where you went through and you did your design consulting, but you also do the upholstery yourself. I, I'm not sure, do you do consulting without doing the upholstery? All the time because I have clients all over the country now and so I do consulting if that's what you want to call it right. for them, long distance clients. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we'll Skype, sometimes we talk on the phone, we, we email and I'll ask for information from them whether it's their artwork on the walls, their rugs or other existing furniture. Then I go out and I shop for them and I put together a box of fabrics and combinations that I think would work well for them. And then so I say, feel free to take it to another local upholsterer. Oh, that is good information. And so do they, do they often just go ahead and ship it to you to, do, to work on? Both. I've done both. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Andrea, I don't know what to do. You're a nice way to make extra money for that design consultant fee. And I love picking out the fabric, so it's good. Well, I remember when we talked in the fall, you were just starting, I think you had just started that design end of it. And so I'm happy to find out that that's working and, and you're getting calls. Like how often would you say you get calls for that? I, I feel a lot of emails and phone calls and they don't always come through, you know, but, but I'll get people saying, do you, can you work with me? I'm in Canada. You know, I've, I've gotten calls from lots of people all over. Mm -hmm. so it really depends. Okay. It's hard to put a, num a number. And is there, do you see a, an ebb and a flow in the time of the year, whether you're busier or not? I'd say, you know, I have other upholsterer friends here in Philadelphia, and they get very busy around Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I don't have that in my business. People who want to work with me, they wait with me, they wait for me, because I can only do so many projects at one time, and it seems like I'm really busy right now in the summertime, and I was wondering if it is an ebb and a flow, but usually I think I'm consistent with about the same number of clients all year round. So that's good. So you've gotten that kind of managed. That's a, I think that's an important part of a business if you're going to have it, um, something that you can sustain over time where it fits in with your life, your other life, yeah. right? Well, and I, I think maybe would I want it, my business to be more? Everyone wants more, more, more. But right now at my stage in my life, I don't want it to be more. This morning I drove my daughter to field hockey camp and took the day off of the studio. So I only want to have no more than a handful of clients at a time because that's all I can handle. Right. Yeah. So that, I mean, and that right there is one of the biggest benefits of what all of us are doing is having the flexibility to have our other life that we, I mean, you know, it's, it's all one life, but you know, to juggle everything. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Um, all right. So this Kathleen still goes on. She wants to do more of the artistic end of upholstery and she's noticing like a lot of us that there are, and, and your chairs are more artistic. Um, she asks you here how you think you, your work is distinguished from somebody else's. What do you think when people um, hear about you or they start to, or they contact you, what are they, what are they coming to you for specifically in your opinion? I think people who are coming to me are a little bit fearless and aggressive because I, I try to make my chairs that. I, I don't do upholstery just anyone's sofa with anyone's plain fabric on and I, I won't I get I'm lucky I get to pick and choose my jobs and so the client that comes to me I think they want to have fun and they want to express themselves and I think they want a showpiece and an artistic statement in their home and they're willing to pay for that 
So you you really get exactly what you want. You don't. I mean, you don't even have to deal with that old ugly couch with the horrible fabric. I give it to my friends. I have two other okay. great upholstery friends, and I give their number out all the time because because I don't want to do that. I know. I know. You're you're far enough along. Um, it's not true, but I still. I mean, even client work. Like if I if I could, I want to do any client work. And I know that sounds awful. I'd love to just make my own beautiful chairs that in, that inspire me. But I do have to, to take client work to pay the bills. Right. Okay. Um, so um, I talked to you. I don't know how, how long ago was that when you were going into New York to the Design Sponge little seminar on. Was that on Instagram, about Instagram or about Facebook? Just uh, social media in general. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. A year ago. So, yeah. so how, how much do you use social media for, to promote your business? I don't use it as much as I should is what I learned at that seminar. Mm -hmm. I should definitely be posting once a day every day. And I'm, you know, maybe once every two weeks. And I have to force myself to do that. And I have fun when I do it. I just get busy and it doesn't, it's not my first nature to do it. Right. But it's a great, great tool. And I would encourage everybody to do it because that's how you meet people all over the world. And then they share it and the, and, and the word spreads. And that's how I have clients all over the country. So it's a great thing. And um, what is it about it? Because we have talked about that in the class. What is it about the social media that um, deters you other than time? It, do you just, is it, like you said, it's not second nature to you. That's what we ran into. These people just, it's not what they want to do. They want to go work on their pieces. I think it's so much fun to stop and take a break and, you know, blab it all out there. So I, I know it takes all kinds, but is that kind of how it goes with you? You just get into your work? I love to work in the studio, but being honest, and I'm putting it all out there, I am definitely afraid of people taking it the wrong way and coming off bragging or boastful in any way. And so I'm very conscious of how I share. And every time I share something, I worry that could this possibly be taken out of context the wrong way? Will people get the wrong impression of me? And so honestly, that's probably why I hold back because... Yeah. Well, I will tell you, I, I feel like I, and I probably do the same, I do that. I think sometimes I say things that sound that way, and I really don't mean it. But I will say that your posts, when you show a piece, is very humble and very, it's very gracious, and it's noticeable. So I think that maybe that motive you have is really comes through. That's good. And that's good for us to know that. That's nice. Yeah, that's nice. Um Okay, so let's see. Okay, so did you sell? I think you were trying to sell on One King's Lane or Cherish, or did that? How did that work out? I started selling first on One King's Lane, and that was terrific. And really, I probably started on Etsy first, and and then I kind of let Etsy go because I thought maybe One King's Lane would be a little more high end or or something. And One King's Lane was terrific, and I sold a lot on there, but. It's expensive, and you have to, you know, give them thirty-five percent. And I found that I really wasn't willing to give thirty-five percent of my hard work to them. So then I gave Etsy another try and Cherish, and, and I've been doing really well on those two two platforms. So I like those. And sometimes, if I want to sell a piece, I think it might sell quicker on One King's Lane, and I'll, I'll throw it up just to maybe see. Get rid of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What take, What's the percentage on Cherish? Cherish, they it used to be twenty or twenty five percent, but now they just adopted something. And based on the price of your product, the higher the price. If it's like over twenty five hundred dollars, they maybe take twelve percent. So they they have a tier system now. I I don't know the numbers exactly. So that works out better for all the sellers, right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, when I was in there, again, I don't want to keep referring to that, but when I was in there, there were pieces and you, you know, like we all have pieces that sit there and you get tired of seeing them. So when you do want to just get rid of something, um, you know, without just giving it away, is what is your best outlet for that? I think maybe Etsy on King's Lane. Okay. No. And how hard is it to get on one King's Lane or to get your, yeah, to get your work up there? It's, Not hard. It's easy. It's just a... One day I had a beer, I went outside, wrote, so wrote an email, and the next day I was on, basically. <laughs> Those are the kind of um, jobs you love, don't you? Yes. Um, all right, so that is all that Kathleen has asked. I think one of the other questions that, and we already answered it, was that you stuff all your cushions with down. Is it a down feather mix? It is a down feather mix, unless the client specifies white goose down. I wish I could afford just goose, goose down, but it's a feather mix. But it's it, really nice. And why won't you, or will you use foam on modern, like if it's a modern piece? 
Yes, okay. I've done a few mid-century modern chairs for clients, and and I've used foam for those because I think that piece calls for it. It wouldn't look right, you know, right without it. But do you have a, do you have some sort of inner, um, you know, like an integrity thing about natural the natural materials? Do you feel do. that way? Okay, do. that's why that's why I started the whole thing, doing the the horse hair and everything, and it's it's against the foam. But I know they make great foam products now, and. And they don't have the chemicals in them that they used to have. It costs more to get those those particular types of foam. But I, I do. Yeah, I know a girl, and you might know her, and she's out in Montana selling all natural foam. And I believe that that will grow. I think the need for that will grow and grow. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me see if there's anything else. Do you have anything else you'd like to share with us? Yeah. How about words of encouragement? Because there are a lot of talented women, and I don't have any men in this class, but they are very talented. They have really good skills. And one of the things that I've told them was that they, um, if they're going to be moving this furniture through and selling it, they can't really get stuck on be. I mean, I, I love perfectionism, but you have to know, and I, I hope you agree with me, you have to know when to move on or yeah. you get bogged down. You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> because I'll put a certain fabric on a chair and I look at it and I've paid hundreds of dollars because I use really expensive fabric too. I'll pay so much money for it and I'll say, oh, it's just, it's not right. And it's fine, it's acceptable. No, I take it off and I'll say to myself, maybe I can make a pillow out of this or, or I'll find something else for it. And I've taken, I change my mind all the time. Oh, no, that is not what we want to hear. But you know what? That is part of it. I think that everybody does that. Yeah. yeah. But, but like you're saying now, I think I've gotten to a certain point where in its confidence, I know I can sell that piece and maybe it is good enough, maybe. And, and it is time to move on to the next would, when you say, if you find a flaw that you've, you know, I don't know, a fold or a tuck or a pucker that you don't like, um, is there a line you draw where you say, you know what, um, n not just good enough, but it's good. It's not, it's d not worth tearing it all back down again. Or, no, you see, I, I was thinking design-wise, fabric-wise, saying it's good enough. If there's a pucker, a tear, a mark, I can't live with it. I can't because I'm charging so much money for my pieces and it's got to be really really on good. It. Yeah. yeah. So, so I start again. Um I don't know that the the um viewers know how much your chairs what the range of price is. Can you share that where you ha feel free to share that? I would say that that the average price per chair is $2800 a chair and that's if they buy the antique chair from me and then I paint it, strip it, you know, and and do the whole shebang and and it's usually about $2800. And if somebody, are you buying, are you selling any in pairs? Do people still love to buy in pairs? Yeah, definitely. And do you discount that if they buy two? I do. I do. Always. Yeah. And, and for, I've got a lot of repeat clients. I'm working with one now, uh, a client in Philadelphia, and I'm doing her fifth piece right now for her. And so, so I do tend to be, you know, fair help, to people like help, that. Well, and help out the return customers. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on your, you know, I am so intrigued with your um, fabric choices, the textiles that you get. And we talked about how you just call them up and order them. I don't really understand, and I don't know whether anybody else does, how these smaller fabric designers, how their um, business is set up. Like who, here in Indianapolis, you can't get like SKL. I don't know how you say Is that how you say it? That's how you say it, SKL. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, you you can't get it anywhere, and so um, how do you, how do people go get these fabrics? Because and I don't want them to go copy your fabrics, but if they want to put really unusual fabrics and textiles mm -hmm. on their pieces, which I think if they want to turn into a artistic furniture flipper, sure. um, they're going to need some fantastic fabric. Right, definitely. And I'll I'll share this with you because this will probably be very helpful. In Philadelphia, we have a wonderful um, street called Fabric Row, and there's these very inexpensive fabric stores on Fabric Row. You can go in, you can get fabric for twenty dollars a yard. And when I first started off, I said, okay, I don't want to go to Fabric Row because that looks very typical, mainstream. I'm I'm gonna go to the maybe look online, Spoon Flower. I'm gonna try some different things, but I'm never gonna spend more than. $50 a yard for fabric, and that was my budget. And I've just bought fabric for $228 a yard. <laughs>
Yeah, do you buy it? And is it always directly from the the person making it? It is. Yeah, or showrooms. You know, if I go to the New York Design Center, you buy from the showroom. But but for these smaller boutique fabric makers, textile designers, you just call them up. Just call them up. Now or send them email. Do you think somebody who is not as well known as you are can just call them up? Absolutely, especially these smaller ones. I find that the larger ones. I was so scared to try to get. Um, my, you have to get accounts from Schumacher and right. Dorothy, and, and you need three. They want you to have three references, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, how do I get three? I remember that I was so scared to even go in there when I first started. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was something that I just wondered because here I'm in the middle of middle of nowhere, and it's really hard. We do have a trade source showroom, but it's really hard to get those unusual fabrics. And you said you just call these people up, right? And I just said, I, don't, I can't even imagine that. Just... They're so nice. They want to sell them their fabric to you. What about and and you also said you can order from you order from London and they ship it over. And how long is that like so expensive or how long does that take? Doesn't matter if you call to more species in London directly. Yeah. You're going to pay the same freight that if you order Pierre Frey from Dora Lee. It, you're paying forty dollars for that package to come. That that shipment is forty dollars. Okay, it's yeah. doable. Yeah. And then you build that into your price, and there you go, and you've got, a, you've got your brand getting started. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I think that was good, at least for this time. We'll have to do another one. Um, okay. But I will I'll turn off this, and you can, everybody can say goodbye to you. Goodbye. Hi, thanks so much. And um, wait, I want to ask you one more thing off this camera. Yeah. And Okay.